Good morning. My name is Adam Johnston and I have the privilege of talking with Doug Carpenter this morning, January the 8th, 2013. Today we're going to have a lot of stories of Camp McDowell and how Doug and his family have been involved. Good morning, Doug. Good morning, Adam. Sure, it's good to be with you today. Thank you, Doug. I feel very honored to be here in your presence. Well, likewise. Well, thank you. Tell us, <laughs> tell us where we are today. Well, it, I'm just realizing what an experience this is for me because this was my dad's office. Um, when he was Bishop of Alabama from 1938 until 1955, he had an attic room over at the Church of the Advent. Diocese was very poor in those days, <clears throat> but he collected money for years. And when George Murray first was elected as, as a suffragan bishop, they moved into this office in 1955. And it made a, meant a lot for the diocese to, to have this location. And over the years, it's been a prime location for involvement in downtown Birmingham. Uh, Dad had a lot of um, people saying, oh, you need to move over the mountain with the office. He said, no, no, 20th Street's important next to the Advent. So it's good to be speaking here because he loved Camp McDowell so much. And if you read his diaries, he tried to go out to every session at Camp McDowell um, from the time it started up. Well, he, he became bishop after he had been at the Church of the Advent. And the first summer he was at the Advent, 1937, he directed senior camp down at Battles Wharf, where camp was at the time. Um, now, was that the first senior camp? That was not. Uh, camp McDowell was started by Bishop McDowell, and it didn't have a name at first, but he was so active with it, they began to name the camps Camp McDowell. And they started in about 1922, down on Mobile Bay, every summer. And eventually they had two camps. One was for people 15 to 25, if you can believe it. And the other was for the juniors, who were like 10 to 14. Uh, and they called that Camp Cobbs. Well, it met down there for years, and one year they actually met at Camp Winnetoska. And then in about 1939 uh, and 1940, they met at Shaco Springs up here at the Baptist Camp. And then in 41, they met on the Marion campus. Then the war came and all camp stopped. And toward the end of the war, after Germany had surrendered, it was either uh, President Roosevelt or President Truman that sent word out that the churches needed to do a lot to encourage home and family life. And one of the things they suggested was camps and conferences. So we started meeting again at Oak Mountain State Park in 1945. I had just turned 12. Um, I'd been to Camp Cosby before, but 1945 was my first year at Camp McDowell. And Peter Horn, who later worked with me at St. Stephen's, and I were in the same cabin. And Bill Stoney was the direct, was the cabin counselor. He was the rector of Grace Church in Anniston. And in those days, the clergy were cabin counselors. And that continued for many, many years. In fact, I think my father kind of insisted that they be cabin counselors. Nowadays, they think that people in their 20s are better cabin counselors than the clergy. May be true, I don't know, but uh, Bill Stoney was such a strong influence on me. And not only that summer 1945, but on for the next seven or eight years, he was such a great storyteller. And I still remember so many of his stories about Albert Schweitzer, and also he uh, taught me how to tell scary stories as well. We called him Father Bill, and he was the first person that I knew at camp who, when he told a story, became so much a part of the story, you couldn't tell the difference between the storyteller and the story. And that's where I began to, to see how important storytelling was. 46, we met at Oak Mountain State Park, 47. At the, in the summer of 47, early on, Scott Epps had been brought to Alabama from 
Georgia with the idea that he would oversee our camps and conferences because he had built Camp Michael in Georgia already. So he came over as the rector of St. John's Ensley and St. Mary's Jasper. And he came to the senior camp. It was my first year at a senior camp. And he said that he needed about 15 boys, girls didn't act as work people in those days, to come with him later that summer to begin to clear off land for Camp McDowell up in uh, Winston County. But we had to be 15. Albert Brame and I were 14. We were so eager. Oh, we begged Scott Epps. He finally said, if you can do 20 push-ups without stopping, uh, you're on. Well, Albert and I both, I never had done 20 push-ups before. Did 20 push-ups, and those 20 push-ups allowed me to be on the first work crew, and that was one of the huge influences of my entire life, then to be so involved with Camp McDowell. Having been on the first work crew at only 14, every summer after that, I could be a work boy. And I was a work boy at Camp McDowell from 1947 until 1955. I knew I'd be drafted in 55, I'd finished college, so I went down to the draft board and asked them when they would draft me. They said, oh, we never know. I said, well, that makes it hard to make plans. If I volunteer for the draft, will you take me sooner? They said, nobody's ever asked us that. <laughs> I said, all right, take me in September, and I'll work at Camp McDowell one more summer. So they said, okay. So <laughs> I worked out there for the last time as a work boy at age 22, then went into the Army for a couple of years. But Scott Epps was such a, a dynamic influence on me and so many others that some of the major themes of my life are illustrated by Scott Epps. The two words of Jesus that came to mean the most to me were follow me. Scott Epps would say, step over here, boys. And I connected those things. And I found that it was in action that the deepest questions of life are answered. It's not in words or thought, but it's in action. Scott Epps would say, step over here, boys. And as we followed him, we found out that we were doing something really significant. We weren't just building a camp. We were building the kingdom of God. We really got that impression. Uh, and that everybody who came there would find a place and that each person was a pearl of great price. So Scott helped me a lot with that. And if I look back now at many of my sermons, they follow the theme of foot, heart, head. Now the hymn, day by day, goes the other way, head, heart, foot. That's the way I wanted it. I wanted to understand first, then to give my heart, and then to follow. But it doesn't work that way. You have to step out before you have answers. Certainty can be a huge handicap when you're looking for certainty. So Scott said, step over here, boys, and we'd step over then. We'd blow up a stump with dynamite or do other dramatic <laughs> things out at Camp McDowell. In those days, we had a herd of cattle. Um, every now and then, they'd kind of stampede, and Scott would throw his hat at them and try to stop them. <laughs> and there were, there were such fun and powerful days. And another thing that we learned from Scott was, although he of course, he wasn't old then, but he seemed old to us. Could work from after breakfast to supper time with only a brief stop for lunch. So we did the same thing. It just seemed like the way you did it. And dug all the lines for the pipes at camp. Did a lot of the plumbing, farming. We farmed a good bit in those days. Took care of the cattle with lifeguard. Every now and then when they needed a cabin counselor, about the first time I was a cabin counselor, I was only about 17. <clears throat> that was a time when I really learned that Camp McDowell really is a place for everybody. Because I had a bunch of rowdy little 10-year-olds in my cabin. But I'd been told that there would be a child coming from Wilma Hall in Mobile. In those days, the entire state was a diocese. And that 
he had not been to camp before, that he was just getting over in Patago and still had to have gentian violet on him. It's a purple medication. That, I don't know if they still use it now, but you'd see children with purple all over them. There was to keep the empatago from being infectious. And so the director of camp said, you'll have to give special attention to this boy from Wilma Hall. Mobile bus came in late in the afternoon, about 4.30. In those days, the bus from Mobile was one of the most exciting things of camp. Florence Tate would always organize all the people in the Mobile area to come up on a bus to gather to camp. By the time they got to camp, they were having a wonderful time already. So I went up to meet the bus. Kids jumped off, jumping around. Where was my boy, you know? When everybody was off, I looked up. And he was this thin, little, emaciated boy with somebody else's clothes on, it looked like. He had a little torn up suitcase. Stood at the door. It was obvious he didn't want to be there. I walked over and introduced myself. I thought he would never come off the bus. He wouldn't talk to me. So I hoped I could lead him to the cabin. He did follow me. When I got there, to make a long story short, at first the boys in the cabin wouldn't wash their hands in the same sink he used, wouldn't get in the shower he used. And by the end of camp, a series of events took place that made him so accepted. The night that everybody thought he was going to jump off the cliff, and I finally got him uh, back to the cabin about midnight. I thought all the boys were asleep, but when he and I settled down, the one that they'd always just called Purple Boy. None of them seemed to know his name, Purple Boy, Purple Boy. About 10 minutes after we lay down, one of the little voices in the cabin said, Good night, John. And John, which was his name, said, Good night, Ralph. Another boy. Good night, John. Good night, Jimmy. Until all nine of the other boys had said good night to him. And after that, he was accepted. There's a place for everybody at Camp McDowell. Sometimes it takes a few days for that to happen. But it, it reminds me of Jamie Carey, who was a roommate of mine in prep school. He was from New York. His mother had died sometime earlier. His father was kind of a wanderer. I said, Jamie, why don't you come down this summer that we finish high school, 1951, be a work boy. He came, and it was so marvelous for him that every summer for the four years he was at Yale University, he came to camp for the whole summer to work. And about the second summer, he said, Doug, are we as, really as wonderful as people treat us here? I said, Jamie, we are. But it's recognized at Camp McDowell, but it may not be recognized in New Haven. <laughs> but at Camp McDowell, everybody is wonderful, which is the truth, because each of us, according to the parable of Jesus, as I interpret it, is a pearl of great price. And Jamie had such a wonderful time there. In 2006, I had a reunion of old timers at camp. There were people who had attended camp or worked there before 1951. <clears throat> we ranged in age from 70 to 86. 59 old-time campers came for a weekend from 10 states. I mean, that says something about camp, doesn't it? California, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and all the states in between, 59 came. The oldest one uh, had been a teenager when camp was on battles, at Battles Wharf. And when she was about 16 in 1936, she met the man that she later married. And all the way from the 30s to the present, Camp McDowell had been so important to her that 
at 86 years old, she came to the reunion. Alan Bartlett, who was the retired bishop of Pennsylvania, had not been to camp since 1947. He went there at Oak Mountain and then he was a work boy in 47. Came back for the first time in 2006. All these people came back to the place where they'd been so inspired. And again, somebody asked me at that old timers camp, why are we so all so wonderful? Did Camp McDowell do it? I said, no, Camp McDowell just explained it. Um, everybody at camp is a pearl of great price. As I became older, um, when I was young in the 60s, I directed senior camp out there year after year for about seven years. In the 80s and 90s, I did better with the third, fourth, and fifth graders. <laughs> I wasn't fast enough <laughs> for the senior camp. Well, those third, fourth, and fifth graders, I think that's the easiest camp to do because they still think adults are great. Uh, whereas sixth graders, they kind of try to be cool and so forth, and it's a while before they get back to appreciating adults. At one of those camps, my wife and I, Ann, would direct together, we had a program based on Pearl of Great Price. And what we did was to hide mirrors all around camp and in the woods. And one morning after chapel, we told the campers that the Pearl of Great Price was hidden. They'd have to go and find it. They went out and they began to find mirrors and two or three of them, when they looked at their own face in the mirror, realized the point of the whole thing, that they were a pearl of great price. One of those little girls was back in touch with me about two weeks ago, and she'd written a story about how it made her feel so wonderful. And of course, when they got to chapel, we had all of them look at the mirror and explain that in Jesus' eyes. And at Camp McDowell, each person is a pearl of great price. That's such an important lesson. And what I've found is that the important lessons have to be lived and experienced like, and Albert Schweitzer often said, you don't get answers to the big questions by thinking, you get them by doing. Um, Schweitzer was such an influence on me because I learned about him at Camp McDowell and when I first heard about him in 1945, he was still only 70 years old. He lived till 90 over in Lamborghini, Africa where he had built his hospital. And Schweitzer had this feeling of reverence, not only for individuals, but all of life. In the jungle, there was no electricity and so he wrote every night, wrote some wonderful things. And at one time he was writing a history of civilization, reading all the books on civilization that bring it in by boats, all these books for him to read. Something was missing in all the histories. He was pondering that. And one day as he was thinking about that on his way over to the hospital, he got a call that a missionary who was up the Ogoe River, had a wife who was dying and he'd have to come. So he found a boat that was going up with supplies and got on the boat. He didn't want to waste the time that it would take, so he was working on his book, History of Civilizations. What was missing though? What was missing? And he describes going up the Ogoe River and seeing animals in the forest and snake in a tree animals coming down for water, suddenly it hit him. What's missing is there's nothing in these histories about reverence for life. Environmentalists, environmentalists love that man today. Reverence for life. He didn't mean just human life, but all life. Reverence for all life. And that became the great theme of his life. And I think that's a theme at Camp McDowell. Reverence not only that each person is a pearl of great price, but all things 
of great value uh, in this creation. And one of the other things I learned about from Scott Epps more than I had understood before is that God's saints can do enormous things from very little. Now God himself creates from nothing. Non nobody can create from nothing. But his saints need very little to be very creative. Where Jesus himself, with just a little fish and bread, fed 5,000. Scott Epps, here's some of the things he did from little. The first 160 acres at Camp McDowell, he was able to buy for $3.75 an acre. I went back and, and checked that figure. The uh, first 160 acres was $600, and that divides out to exactly $3.75 an acre. Isn't that amazing? The first girls' cabins cost $15 a piece because he found out they were downsizing Fort McClellan and putting buildings up for bid. He got plenty of cabins for the girl campus for $15 a piece. The boys had barracks. The most expensive one of those was $150. Epps Hall was like maybe $150. The original Epps Hall, half of that's now the work shed. So camp was literally started from so little, but by a saint, so it did so much. The first money that was raised to build Camp McDowell was pennies. My father, wanting everybody to be involved, thought that everybody had pennies. And in those days, he was the only bishop in the whole state, and so he went to every congregation at least once a year. And he sent ahead of himself these little paper peanut bags, you know, like you get peanuts at the circus in. Everybody in the congregation got a bag and was supposed to save their pennies. Well, who wouldn't save pennies? When he came, they would present him with the pennies. And I was, you know, at that time was only 13 or so years old. I was so impressed he would come home with a bag of pennies that was almost too heavy for me to lift. And that's how they, they got the money to start Camp McDowell. Well, that led on to things. In 1948, there was the um, Bishop's Program for Youth. And uh, they raised an enormous amount of money. $266,000 was seen as huge in 1948. With that, they continued to build at Camp McDowell, built Canterbury Chapel, improved the Auburn Center, um, did work at several of the other colleges, uh, including Montevallo, and that was the Bishop's Youth Program. Alabama came to be known throughout the Episcopal Church as the diocese that knew about youth work. I didn't know that we had that reputation, but when I was in seminary, um, between 57 and 60, Lex Matthews was a classmate of mine. And when they began to teach us about youth work, the teacher said, well, there are two people here that can teach you more about youth work than anybody else. It's Lex Matthews and Doug Carpenter because they're from Alabama. Well, of course, we didn't teach the class, but it was a nice way to express how Alabama was interested in young people. That starts with Bishop McDowell's intense interest in young people. Every bishop that we've had since then, my father, he would go to camp every session if he could, unless he was at Lambeth Conference or something. Uh, camp McDowell was so important to him. Randy Clayman, who was the first suffragan bishop, would spend weeks out at Camp McDowell during the summer as the suffragan bishop. Uh, and then George Murray, who followed Clayman as the suffragan, was such a fantastic person with Camp McDowell. Then we have Stow. I first met Bill Stow in uh, the uh, first real summer of Camp McDowell, 1948. And the shed that the work boys had lived under in 47 served as one of the cabins. It had no sides to it. Of course, nobody had running water that first year at Camp McDowell. Bill Stow was a counselor in that shed up there with his boys. They'd come marching down the hill together to meals. And that's when I first knew 
Stow, and he gained this enormous affection for Camp McDowell. During his time, one of his great contributions to our diocese was the beginning of Crescio, which at first uh, met a couple of times outside of camp, but then realized all those sessions should be right there at Camp McDowell. And no matter where he was on that Sunday of the closing, he would get to camp for the closing at Camp McDowell. And then after Stow, uh, Bob Miller had an intense interest in camp. His ashes are buried up there. That's how interested he was in Camp McDowell. Uh, and then we've had Parsley, who's taken a great interest in camp, and now Keith Sloan, who's Mr. Camp himself. Uh, his idea of, of developing a whole new village at camp, Bethany Village, for people who are limited his idea of starting up the farm work at Camp McDowell again. Uh, this whole campaign that we'll have in the diocese beginning just about now um, is going to be just incredible. We have so many people wanting to be at camp and there's no space for them. Thousands of people. The environmental program at camp is, I don't know that there's any place that there's an environmental program that, that is that good. All these things started in small ways and have been such an enormous influence to so many people. But I'm talking on. You got any, <laughs> anything you want to ask me? Well, Doug, <laughs> Doug, you did a great job talking about the bishops and how they've been active at Camp McDowell. Will you please talk about uh, the directors of Camp McDowell throughout the years and the, the time periods that they've served and your memories of them as well? Well, the, uh, it was considered such a high privilege in 1948 and on to be selected to be a, a director at Camp McDowell. And in those days, it worked like this. Um, the diocese would call Bill Mann, for example, example, who was the director of St. Paul's Mobile, and say, we want you as director of senior camp. Then he had to raise his entire staff. Even up when I started directing senior camp in the 60s, it worked that way. I'd be the director. Camp would supply lifeguards, but I had to supply the entire staff, all the cabin counselors. And this was wonderful. I, I know we don't do it this way now, but it, what I would do is have a lot of them come from my own parish, and then all those people I knew around the diocese have to get enough for cabin counselors for every cabin and program directors and so forth. It built such a wonderful team that when we went back home from camp, I was in Huntsville during most of those years to St. Stephen's Huntsville. We just brought camp with us back to the parish. So later, when I started St. Stephen's here in Birmingham, that same feeling of, of being Camp McDowell in the city uh, made St. Stephen so much of, of what it is. And I know now that, that um, it's hard for directors to get up their whole staff, but it was easy in those days somehow to do that. And I always had clergy as cabin counselors. Um, one of the more notorious ones was Bill Treat. Bill was at St. John's as an assistant in Montgomery. And he had been a boxer before he went to seminary. He had a lot of scar tissue around his eye. Well, after I directed senior camp for a few years, I knew which boys would likely cause trouble at night. So I put them in Bill Treat's cabin. Well, Bill would go to sleep, and because of that scar tissue, one of his eyes would pop open after he'd been asleep about three or four minutes. These guys would get up and try to slip out, and they'd see Bill's eye watch them, and they'd all get back in bed. <laughs> and uh, he also was a great athlete. Uh, he and Henry Heath and I uh, worked together for years up there as, as a team, and we would have contests with the kids. Like, we told the kids one summer that we could do anything they could do better than they could. Well, the next summer, a boy from Gunnersville challenged me to swim underwater in the, in the pool. Well, being wiser, I said, you go first, because that always gives you the advantage. 
He went four lengths of the pool underwater. <laughs> well, I wasn't going to be beat. So, and in those days I was, you know, young. I dove in and I went one length, two lengths, three lengths. I started back for the fourth length. I started seeing the most beautiful colors that I've ever seen in my life. But I was still conscious enough to know that often when you're drowning, you see colors like that. So I came up and I was about four feet from the end of, <laughs> end of the pool. So he beat me and no longer could we say that we could do anything better than the campus could do. Henry Heath was great about names. He could get the campus together about the third day and name every camper. Some of them would try to disguise themselves even, so he couldn't name him, but he could always do that. No camper could do it. Emmett Griffin, who was one of the great clergymen in this diocese and the chaplain at university, had that capacity. He could just visit camp for a day or two and name everybody at camp. I asked him once, because I wanted to know his trick. What's your trick? No trick. He said, I've just always been able to do that. He says, I memorize things without trying. When he would hospital visit, and there was a room number that he was supposed to go to, well, he'd sing the tune of the hymn that's that number, and he knew <laughs> you could name any hymn, and he could tell you what number it was in the hymn book. Wonderful guy, and having the clergy so involved at camp lets young people know these clergy well, and that, that they are human beings too, and, and I think this is one of the things that's brought great strength to this diocese is the relationship between clergy and people and bishops and clergy, and, and uh, this has been one of the, of the great contributions of Camp McDowell. I agree, Doug. A, a central theme that we're hearing over and over again is how influential Camp McDowell is to the youth, how it was formed to serve the youth, and how much it influenced you as a youth to then go and, and do great things in your life. And talk about how it must feel to be able to go back to camp now with your grandson, and then maybe thinking about them and your children growing up at camp and how it's been a part of uh, your children's life as well. Yeah, it has. Uh, unfortunately, most of my children have lived away from uh, Birmingham. Of course, first we lived in Huntsville and then Lynchburg, and then they lived in Tennessee. But they have been there and they love camp. Um, and recently, one of the interesting things to me was my daughter Fontaine's husband had never been to camp, so he started coming with her on Labor Day weekend. And he liked camp. And a few weeks ago, he read my biography of my father. And he kept calling me up. I didn't realize camp was so important. Uh, I didn't know what all the history was. And just reading in that history has made him just so interested in Camp McDowell now. Um, so it's, it's you know, it, it continues. Camp McDowell has a strong influence. My son Stephen has built a camp up in Memphis, um, modeled a lot out of Camp McDowell. He came down and talked to your father when he was, was building that camp. Um, so it, yeah, it, it continues on. And it started way back, too. When my father was first ordained in 1926 and was rector of Grace Church, Savannah, one of his first projects was to urge the Diocese of Georgia to have their own camp location. And that happened while he was still in Georgia. Um, and they've, they've had camps over there ever since. That's the, Georgia and Atlanta were separate dioceses from way, way back. And then Scott Epps built the conference center in the Atlanta Diocese. And so the, there are a lot of ripples of connections between all of this and probably Sewanee has to be mentioned as having such a strong influence on it. Back in the, I know in the 20s, people all over the, the fourth province would go to Sewanee just like they now go up to uh, Canuga and uh, had camps and conferences during the summer up there at Sewanee. And, and what that did was bring together so many people around the southeast that shared the importance of camps and conferences. Well, Doug, talk about um, how important it is 
at camp to have these relationships with not only your peers, um, the deacons in your church, um, other people from around the state, strangers as people might say, or, or new people. How important is that? It is so important. Um, I saved all the address lists, that tells you something, of all the camps I went to, and I found out others have. I still stay in touch. My girlfriend from the second year at Oak Mountain State Park, Lee Martin Frazier, and I have always stayed in touch. Um, she lives in Montgomery, and she and her husband and I are just great friends now, and that stretches all the way back to 1946. Albert Brain, Peter Horn, and others were together in 1945. We've always stayed in touch. Um, and it's not only the group from the parishes and the diocese, but I have always tried to su uh, support on scholarship, and the camp helps with the scholarships. Kids who would never have a chance to do something like this. Um, they live in, in places like Midfield and um, the parts of Birmingham where houses are boarded up and school systems are bad. Those kids will tell me that they look forward to Camp McDowell all year. Uh, and it's just such a highlight because when they go to camp, they're somebody. They're really somebody. Um, and over the years, this has been true when I started St. Stephen's, there was poverty all around St. Stephen's on one side and wealth all around on the other side. We went a little piece of land that was called Middle Ground when we started there and Slab Town was on some one side, the old. And we sent a lot of the poverty kids, white mostly they were, that, that lived close to the church there. When I had the funeral of one of the boys who we had sent to camp for a number of years as a child, when I had the funeral of his father, oh, 10 or 15 years ago, he came to my office the next day and said, I, would, I want to thank you for Camp McDowell. He'd been out there when he was like 11, 12, 13. He remembered all about it. He was now like 40 something. He said, I want you to know that when I went to Camp McDowell, it was the first time I'd ever eaten a meal at a table with other people. Now, that's hard for some of us to realize, but when we first knew this family, they lived in an old abandoned uh, bus near St. Stephen's. Um, they became part of, of our parish in a big way. But he had never eaten a meal at a table with a family. And then he said, and then I went to church, to the chapel at Camp McDowell, and I ate at that table. Ate at that table with everybody else. And uh, what a powerful influence that was on the life of a, a person who had had almost nothing else. Some of my nephews have, have come here from all over the country. Uh, my nephew, Charlie Carpenter, my brother's oldest son, who's now a heart surgeon up in Maine, came when they lived in, in uh, Ohio and spent the summer here and worked at camp when he was 15. And that was such a powerful part of, of his life, even though it was just there that, that one summer. So you can go on and on uh, talking about how camps influenced people. Uh, in 1980, I suggested we have a reunion of work boys. No girls had been work boys by 1980, so it was just work boys. And what I asked the work boys to do was also to send me a short paragraph of an experience that had at camp. I've got several pages of those still, and I can't remember the exact number, but we must have had 45 or so work boys that showed up at camp. And their stories were so great. Paul Smith said, you know, I'm a lawyer in Birmingham. I had Paul's funeral not too long ago. I'm a lawyer in Birmingham, and even as a lawyer, I would always find myself saying, what would Scott Epps have done? <laughs> that was before the what would Jesus have done time. Um, 
and others wrote things about how they knew how to do all the plumbing in their house because they'd worked for Scott Epps <laughs> and things they'd learned. Um, I think it was Bob Black who said, just the little things like when we were work boys and we wanted to move a log, we'd say one, two, three, throw. And Mr. Epps said, boys, you never see Mr. Gober and me stand around counting, we just throw it. You're wasting time. Just go, just do it. Don't count one, two, three. Um, which reminds me of Mr. Gober. We've only had two long-term caretakers at camp, Marcus Gober and uh, Rick Johnson and their wives with them. Uh, back when I was even your age, we called everybody Mr. and Mrs. Isn't that funny? Mr. Gober and Mrs. Gober, Mr. Apps, Mrs. Apps. It, it was really hard for me as I got in my 30s to start calling Mr. Epps Scott or Francis, Francis. But Mr. Goba um, was a scrawny looking guy who had grown up mostly in Winston County, except for during the Second World War, he went down and worked in the shipyards in Mobile. He taught us so much uh, about so many things. And he'd hardly been to school at all, but he read encyclopedias in the Bible. And I went back to visit him, I think it was about 1970, and I had my four kids with me. We were living in Lynchburg at the time, and we were down here for a week. We went out to camp, and, and I heard Mr. Goble was dying. He had moved back to his old house at Double Springs, and Rick Johnson and Louise had moved into the house at camp. So the kids and I, my children were maybe 10 years old, roughly, all four of them pretty close in age. We met Ms. Goba, and Ms. Goba said, you children come help me pick some beans out here. So I went on in to see Mr. Goba. He was hardly anything but skin and bone left his wire rim glasses were on the table beside his bed and he could hardly talk. He always stuttered. Did it, Douglas, he said, do you remember that time over by Grady Noblet's house? We were out there pitching hay and I asked you what you were going to do with your life. I said, <laughs> of course, I remember that, um, Mr. Goba. When I started thinking more about going into the ordained ministry, he said, I thought so. He only lived a, oh, a week or two after that. I walked out of the house and stepped down that, you know how everybody sweeps their yards up in that part of the state, out of that warm sand and smell the pine trees, and Ms. Goba came up with my kids. We became so close with the people who worked there, as well as the people who went there. And, and Mr. Goba was the fellow I always worked under. More recently, it's been Rick Johnson, and there's still that closeness with those people. Um, and they influenced us a great deal, I think, in, and their ability to persevere and their, and, and their endurance was just terrific. You credit the, the lessons learned at camp as a young and middle-aged, and every lesson <laughs> at camp is, is an incredible lesson shared by many now, as, as they call it, the camp family. So many is, is now family. Oh, yeah. And talk about how you'd like to see the family continue and the, some of the really big important lessons of, of the family, of, of, uh, of the church, and also how that's, a, that's related to the town. Well, in this expansion of camp, we will have, uh, some people say, well, if camp gets that big, it won't have the same feeling of, of belonging. It will, it'll still be. It will still be, and I know that that will happen because people said the same thing about St. Stephen's Church here. Some of them didn't like it when we moved out of the little prefabricated barracks. Um, but it's 1,900 people now, and you get the same feeling there. 
if you pay attention, you can keep that intimacy no matter how big a place gets. And Camp McDowell will keep that, I'm convinced of it. Um, one of the things that, that I hope the more the newer clergy uh, will realize is that it's important for the congregations to keep hearing illustrations from camp and sermons uh, to keep them involved. I've found that the clergy who use illustrations from camp always have the biggest number of kids at Camp McDowell. And to kind of keep that environment between the parishes and the, and the camp, I think that's so important and, and for all the clergy to be involved out there um, as well as the, as the lay people. I agree, Doug. Not only for the youth is it important to gather in place, but also for adults as well. And not only does camp have the summer camp and the environmental camp, it's also a conference center. And you spent several times at the conference center where you're coming together with some of your fellow peers. Talk about how the conference center is really a, a place to share positive learning. The conference center is, is terrific. Uh, our vestry goes up there, for instance, every January. That's where the big plans are made for St. Stephen's. Since I've retired and am considered the chaplain to the retired clergy and spouses, that's a lot of us these days. We've had uh, four conferences for the retired up there. The last one was this last August. They all said, we want to start meeting yearly now, so we'll have another one next August. So that that group, you know, which is, you know, all retired clergy and spouses enjoys coming up for those. Um, we've had several uh, conferences for old campers. Uh, some of them don't like the word old timers anymore, so I call it now early campers instead of old timers. <laughs> I just, a fellow who works in my yard uh, since I've got such poor balance now, I, I hate it, but it, I can't really do the work in the yard that I want to, told me that he and quite a few others went up for, for a New Year's weekend at Camp McDowell uh, and had such a wonderful time up there over New Year's. When everybody else thinks about football and some, they were at Camp McDowell. Uh, my whole family met up there one time for New Year's weekend. Um, the camp has always got people there. And you see more and more of these stickers, I'd rather be at Camp McDowell. I felt like I couldn't put one on my car while I was a rector of St. Stephen's because I don't, didn't want them to think I'd rather not be at St. Stephen's. So, but now that I'm retired, I have one. And the reason I have it is I bought Joy Phipps' old car and, it, and she already had that on there. I'd rather be at Camp McDowell. And the thousands of children that go up there for the environmental program. My wife has taken her employees to Camp McDowell. Some of them had never really been out in the woods. Uh, her company has also sponsored uh, some of the environmental kids, especially from Bessemer. Their kids who go to Camp McDowell from Bessemer who've never been outside of Bessemer. Some of them thought there would be lions and tigers up there and kind of barricaded the door the first night they were at camp. They've never had that experience. I talked to a 61-year-old lady last week who has grown up in Birmingham. She's never left the city. She's never seen a cow. That's how limited her environment is. She's never seen a cow. Um, at Camp McDowell, you see all kind of things that you're not going to see in the city. Um, I want to talk about crows just for a minute. I don't know why that made me think of it, but one time I was up there at a conference and I got up early, early in the morning, was walking across the ball field. Nobody else seemed to be around. And I heard crows calling and it echoes off the bike. And they seem to know how to synchronize their calls with the echo. And I just thought, I never realized how wonderful crows were before. And they were talking to each other. I've since found they have a limited vocabulary. And it was just so beautiful. 
And I heard God speak to me. He said, do you like it? And I said, yes. And then I thought, I'm talking out loud. He didn't talk out loud. Why am I talking out loud? Do you like it? And then I realized, I thought he was asking me if I liked the crows. Well, I did like the crows, and I've always liked the crows since. They're always, if, when I walked to St. Stephen's, or when I walked to St. Stephen's for the early service Sunday, there were always crows that were calling to me. But I realized he wasn't asking me just did I like the crows. He wanted to know that I liked the whole thing, the whole planet, the universe. And again, I spoke out loud, even though I thought that was silly. Yes, I like it. I like it all. Not long after that, I had a dream that I'd gone to heaven. And God said to me there, did you like it? And I said, yes. And he said, did you like the Grand Canyon? And I had to say, I've never been there. But I have been to the Carver River. <laughs> and I've been to Camp McDowell. But Camp McDowell gave me through, through that and so many other things an, an intimate feeling about the whole universe. And for me that's important partly because when I was a youth and would lie on the grass at night and look up at all those stars, I would feel so very lonely because how vast it is. We now know even more how many planets there are in the Milky Way and how could, how could a person have any importance in that? Sometimes I couldn't sleep at night thinking about how insignificant we were and how limited, how, how impossible that we have any value. But through camp and things I learned like from Albert Schweitzer that you learn from doing more than you do from thinking, I feel close to the universe now. Um, and I think what Schweitzer meant by learning by doing is you can't learn that you have any value until you treat other people as valuable. You learn about yourself through what you do with other people. And uh, here the great Albert Schweitzer, who was uh, the great intellect, I think, of the last century, to say that you learn more from doing than by thinking, uh, I found very true in my life. It's in our relationships. And when I lie on the grass now and look at the universe, I don't feel alone. When I heard those crows calling, it was an expression of uh, liking the, the planet, liking the universe, not just the people, but the whole thing. Uh, the whole thing is good. And peop lots of people have had experiences like me with the crows out there. Um, I have had one bad experience at camp, and I just speak for myself about this because I know some people like hunting, but I was down by the creek as a teenager on a walk along that path that goes along, went along Clear Creek, and there was a beautiful duck flying over. And there was a man up ahead of me on the trail, I don't know how far up, but he shot the duck. And it must have hit his wing, because one wing couldn't work. And the, with the other wing, he tried to fly. And of course, all he could do was circle till he landed down on the rocks. And that seems so far from reverence for life to me. Um, that may be part of why I'm a vegetarian. And my son, Stephen, who's uh, ordained, said, if you're a vegetarian, why don't you promote it for other people? And I said, no, I don't. It's just where I am. I can't eat animals or birds. Um, and one reason I can't promote it is Jesus ate lamb, right? Um, Schweitzer ate, was not a vegetarian. But just for me, my, just personally, um, I think camps influenced me a lot to uh, take my reverence for life a little further uh, than probably as need be. We raised cattle at camp for a while, and the children named a lot of them. 
and <laughs> would have hamburgers for lunch down Epps Hall in the mess hall, and they'd say, who are we eating today? And I think that influenced me some <laughs> in that in that respect. But that's for me. I don't. I can't advocate that because um, that's not a requirement. But for me, it's important uh, as part of that. Camp has to always uh, remind you of Copland in, in the chapel. Uh, at one of the senior camps, I did a big survey and wrote a long article about it, about what was more important, most important to teenagers. And the Copland in the chapel was way up at the top of the list, where you go there at the end of the day, and uh, in the old days you could hear the creek going by, now you can hear the water over the dam. You hear bullfrogs and tree frogs and all the night sounds that some people call God's choir out there. And at the end of Copland, we used to sing always, uh, good night, we must part, God keep watch over us all. And the, the old chapel, the new chapel is wonderful. The old chapel for so many of us is such a revered place. I conducted Francis Epps funeral in that chapel. And I don't know how I did it, but I sang, good night, we must part. At her funeral, yeah. what a wonderful person she was. She, um, she worked at camp along with Scott from 1948 to 1978. I had I conducted the burial of Scott too over in Athens, Georgia, that cemetery behind the stadium over there. He was originally from Athens, Georgia. <clears throat> a lot of work boys showed up from all over. We shoveled the dirt on, finished up the service, and there was an old man there, and I don't know who he was, I still don't, I should have asked at the time. He said, well, Francis, Scott's wife, well, Francis, I bet Scott's up in, up in heaven building another church camp. And Francis said, yeah, and I'm not washing the dishes this time. <laughs> she had a wonderful sense of humor. And do you think, Doug, do you think Scott, Mr. Epps and his wife ever knew camp would develop into such a, a marvelous place? Was he a, a, a man of vision and did, did St. Michael have the same? Scott Epps had one of the same qualities my father did. They hardly ever looked back. They hardly ever talked about the past. They always were looking ahead. And, and I think that's what it takes. Um, so I think Scott knew what he could do out there. He had that, that understanding that others of us caught on as, as time went, went on. Um, in the midst of, of all the wonderful things he did, too, he loved to play tricks. Um, <laughs> we used a lot of dynamite in the early days. I don't know why we didn't blow ourselves up, but you could just go into Jasper and buy a case of dynamite, so we blew up stumps and, and rocks and all kind of things. And one night, <laughs> Charlie Douglas, who was a very proper priest from St. John's, in Montgomery, was a cabin counselor. Several of us were work boys, and Mr. Epps who were up raiding the kitchen late at night. And uh, Mr. Epps thought we could play a trick on Charlie Douglas. And he said, boys, we're going to make Charlie Douglas come running out of his cabin, and I'll bet you he wears pajamas. Well, I don't know if kids wear pajamas now. We never wore pajamas. Scott Epps would never wear pajamas. People even thought he left, slept with his pith helmet on and a machete in his hand, his broke hands on. But he said, I bet you Charlie wears pajamas. Let's find out. So he said, now here's a garbage can, and if you blow up dynamite under a garbage can, it really makes a noise, a great noise. And when I do that, flip off all the lights in camp. 
So we blew up the dynamite and the lights went out. And I mean, it wasn't three or four minutes till Charlie Douglas was up there seeing what the trouble was. And sure enough, he wore pajamas, but Scott was laughing even more because he had pretty little slippers on. <laughs> so he had fun and Charlie enjoyed the joke too. And, and uh, so there was a lot of that that went on in the midst of everything else. A lot of play and fun. Scott thought, he, he liked dynamite so much that he thought that if we bored holes in the cliff on the other side of the creek, this was before there was any kind of dam then, and also we needed sandstone for the chapel that we built, because most of that sandstone came from down the creek mine. He thought if we bored holes in that cliff over there, which is 75 feet high, whatever, that we could break a lot of great stone out of it. So we did that, and we put dynamite in there, and they lit it, and all it did was just shoot out across the creek. It didn't even crack a stone. <laughs> it was like a great cannon shooting across the creek. <laughs> but he was a daredevil. In the early days, Clear Creek Falls was still there, and, and lots of trips were over to... On, it, you, you could go down in a canoe, but, but usually it would take a lot of, of people in a truck to Clear Creek Falls. It was the name of a little city, but maybe there were three or four houses. There was a 40-foot fall and about, oh, five or 600 yards down another 40-foot fall. There was a drop of 80 feet in Clear Creek and just, you know, a few hundred yards. So we were over there once and we were standing on the top. Of course, that's all under Smith Lake now. We were standing on the top of the first falls and it was at least 40 feet. And Scott said, let's jump, boys. And he jumped in without even checking to see if there are any logs or anything down there. Well, Albert Brame and I thought we could do even better, so we dove in. When you dive from 40 feet, you have to be careful that your feet don't go over too far. Mine went over a little too far, and I never told anybody, but I thought I'd broken my back <laughs> when I landed in that water. But I think that's one reason he attracted young people is he was a daredevil too. Uh, he wasn't worried about it. He'd grab a snake by the tail and throw it around. Um, there wasn't anything that scared him or bothered him too much. So you learned a lot, many lessons learned. <laughs> yep, and, and learned how not to try some things. <laughs> lots of fun, lots uh -huh. of fellowship as well. And, yeah. And talking about, I remember how you met someone who, uh, a very memorable experience was just sharing the meal at camp. So much of camp is... Yeah is overlooked in uh, small things, but for some, just the simple acts of the camp fellowship means a lot. Talk about you and your grandson sharing camp at the camp session when you and your grandson. You remember me when I was out there with, I've been out there with several grandchildren for the Eichelbiters camp. Well, uh, Justin Carpenter, who's now 22, and uh, working for a gas company in uh, Texas. He's graduated from University of Tennessee. When he was at graduated from the first grade, he and I went to the first, second grade camp. And boy, that, I was a grandfather by that time, and they expect to do everything in two days that you usually would do in a week at camp. I was exhausted when we left there Sunday afternoon. So we drove out of camp and Justin said, Grandpa, tell me a story. So I told him a story on the way to Double Springs. That's a easier way to go on up to Memphis. And when I got to Double Springs, I said, Justin, I've got to not tell you a story as I go through this big city of Double Springs because I got to pay attention. I'll tell you another one when we get to the other side. Well, he fell asleep. We drove all the way to Memphis with him sleeping. And he woke up as we drove into their driveway in Memphis. And then I had to drive back to Birmingham. <laughs> but those, those uh, camps are wonderful where the parents come with the children and they all stay in the same cabins. And, uh, and also Trevor, uh, more recently I was up there with Trevor. That may be the one you remember because he's only uh, 14 now. And uh, Trevor and I had a, had a great time, and he was so excited because we slept in Carpenter Cabin, 
which was named for my father, that one of the boys' cabins was named for my dad down there. And uh, Trevor and I had a wonderful time, and he still thinks a lot about that. And that's why his family always comes back Labor Day weekend. They don't ever miss Labor Day weekend down there uh, at Camp McDowell. Well, Doug, to say that you're, that you and your family are part of Camp McDowell would be an understatement. Well, that's true. Um, there's one group that I wish used camp more than it used to, but one reason may be that there are less deaf people now since we've learned how to, to uh, prevent deafness after, you know, when children are sick. But we used to have big deaf conferences up there. One time there were 300 deaf people that, that um, uh, came to Camp McDowell when Dr. Fletcher was the, the uh, deaf priest. 300. And um, I was a lifeguard for that conference, and we all practiced understanding what it would be if a deaf person said, help, <laughs> with their hands. Um, but the deaf don't use camp as much as they did at one time, and, and that whole deaf community is not um But this, this is partly because some people feel that it's better to mainstream. Um, but Dr. Fletcher would, would gather a lot of deaf. Also, there were diocesan picnics up there in the first few years of camp that would attract, Scott Epps said one time, 500 people. I don't know that there were really 500, but people would come from all over and bring their picnic lunch, have communion outside. Uh, this was, you know, real early in camp. Um, and there are a lot of, of uh, things that have gone on and on, like women's retreat and uh, father and son, and it just keeps on and on. When I was in Leadership Birmingham, we had our closing conference in 1984 up at Camp McDowell. Um, nurses go up there for retreats. It's, it's used by so many people. I agree, Doug. It's such a, a wonderful meeting place for so many diverse groups. Mm -hmm. Um, so many wonderful, diverse groups. Um, talk about those who aren't Episcopalian. Talk about, is there any difference between them when they come to Camp McDowell? Or is it a place for everybody, or is it just a... Camp McDowell really is a place for everybody. It's very inclusive. I don't think anybody ever says, are you an Episcopalian? I mean, and obviously we practice open communion there, which... I hope most of our parishes do that now, too. Um, it's the first experience that some people have with a sacramental life, with, you know, with bread and wine and, and the table. Um, it's, it's the first experience for some. And um, so I don't think that people are really aware of, you know, what denomination or if any denomination or whatever. Uh, there is a... And I think for a lot of non-Episcopalians to come to Camden Dow is a very eye-opening experience mm -hmm. of the whole community of Camden Dow. And you've been, uh, you and your family have been a part of the Episcopal Church for a long time. Well, we have. Um, on one side of my family, we've got a long stretch of Presbyterians. That's on my maternal grandmother's family, the Joneses from Georgia. My father's side, Episcopalians who came in through New England and crossed over, and by the time his father was born, they went to Detroit. That's an interesting combination. My father was only one generation from plantation life on his mother's side, and only one generation from an industrial Detroit on his father's side. I bring that out in, in his biography to show the enormous changes some people have had to go through culturally. Um, and we haven't done it as fast as we could, of course. Um, but but there have been some enormous cultural changes, and I think camps helped a lot with that. Now, Winston County itself has its own culture. Oh, yeah. Is that very similar for what Cam McDowell, Cam McDowell is very open-minded. Is Winston County, was, was Winston County known as a very progressive place? When McDowell first moved there. When McDowell first moved there, uh, Mr. Goba, who was the first caretaker, he started there in 48, just right off the bat. The minister at his church was telling his congregation that we were a communist outfit. 
And he knew that because some of the men had beards and people wore shorts and there was no American flag. And we could have had that place burned down, but Mr. Gober stood up in church and in his stuttering way told them that we were good Christian people. But when he came back to camp the next day, he said to Mr. Epps, we've got to put an American flag up. So <laughs> that's when the first flagpole went up. But Mr. Epps didn't make us start wearing long pants, so. But it, it, yeah, there were, were situations like that at camp. Plus, there were no black people in Winston County. And we brought the teachers from Phillips High School and Ramsey High School, mostly to be the cooks in the early days, but they, they knew that they should not leave camp property while they were there. And we were segregated at camp until 1965. And that year, my father made what he called a guided democracy decision. Rather than having debate or discussion, he just told the diocese, we're going to start integrating camp this coming summer. And it was not till 65, which seems late, um, but that's how it happened. And after that, we've been integrated. Unfortunately, we don't have many black Episcopalians in Alabama, which is easy to understand because a black person who goes through college and graduate school, particularly during the 60s, when my dad was having such a hard time getting any black leadership, why would they come to, to Alabama when they could go to Connecticut or other places? A lot of the civil rights black people here left because they had to protect their families. Uh, Fred Shuttlesworth left here in like about 1961 to go to Ohio after he was bombed so many times. He would come back down a lot. He was not afraid of anything himself. But it was very difficult Ku Klux Klan was a powerful force in this state. Um, and that had to be recognized because any move toward integration would start houses being bombed. That's, that's something that local people had to deal with that people outside were not that aware of. But we did integrate camp and there's no question about it now, of course. But it took a while to get that done. Camp is definitely a tremendous place for people of all race, all creed, all age. Yeah. It's a wonderful place. It's continuing to grow more and more acres. It's over a thousand acres now. Camp Bell is now looking for an expansion. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about uh, the term Bethany and what that means in a Christian sense and what the new, the new addition, what that brings to camp. Bethany uh, is going to be a wonderful place and the way that property was bought over there is interesting. The father of the man who gave the money to buy that extensive piece of property, I don't know how many acres is over there, but it's a big piece of property. The retired doctor whose father used to be a lawyer in uh, Jasper, I don't, I don't know whether to mention names, but his father during the depression, when people had no money, would accept land as payment. In the end, because as I told you, land wasn't worth much, 375 an acre. Um, he ended up with a lot of land in Winston County. Well, now, even if that land's only worth $100 an acre, that's a big increase. So his son thought that that money ought to come back into Winston County. And so he gave that enormous amount of money to buy the rest of that land over there. And I think that's an an interesting story of uh, giving back. And to develop Bethany, most people are aware of Key Sloan's camps for special people um, and how successful he did that in Mississippi and then how successful he does it here. And what an influence that is on so many people. So that kind of triggers need for uh, areas that are more suitable for crippled people or blind people or whatever. And going along with that is the desire to have a farm again, the desire to always have space. Sometimes you have to reserve places even in the summer up at the lodge a year ahead of time. 
um, will add a, a bigger complex for vestry meetings and that type of thing. Uh, it's a good time. The timing's right, um, and we can do it, and it'll 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 be a wonderful expansion of Camp McDowell, uh, expanding the uh, site for people with special needs as well as as the other things that'll happen at the same time. So the mission of McDowell, as long as it can reach more people, then we should invest in, yeah. in doing that. And yeah. one thing that the current executive director, uh, Reverend Johnston, always says is that uh, McDowell is a place that he wishes the rest of the world would be. That's right. And so a lot of people come to McDowell and learn experiences like you've shared today. All right, well, one last thing, and then we'll call a close to this, unless you have something special you want to ask about bringing camp into the rest of the community. When camp couldn't meet during the Second World War, the young people were really worried because they had such a spirit, even though they didn't have a camp that, where we owned the property, that a group, including Peggy Roop, who's still here in Birmingham, Peggy Horn Roop, started what they call CSP, Camp Spirit Preservation. And they were gonna keep that camp spirit going even if we couldn't have summer camps. And so they developed a, a group called Camp Spirit Preservation, but it was in the initials. And when we started meeting at camp again at Oak Mountain State Park in 45, it was a, promoted as a secret thing people would sing, CSP wants to meet you, CSP wants to greet you, but you didn't know what it meant until you'd been at camp for one session, and then you were inducted into camp spirit preservation. And a lot of us still often to each other will end our letter. You know, it's hard sometimes to know what to put at the end of a letter, I love you, or peace, or blessings, or just put CSP and sign your name. So that's gone on since probably 1941, that's Camp Spirit Preservation. And the idea is not to preserve it just for camp sessions, but to preserve it in the parishes and the schools, where you work, to, to bring Camp McDowell into this building, into downtown Birmingham, into the civil rights movement, uh, and into the whole place. Uh, Peggy Horn, needs special recognition as a promoter of youth work in this uh, diocese. She, um, when she graduated from Phillips High School, she started working at the Church of the Advent, and then eventually she became the youth worker for the diocese. And when Martin Luther King asked Andy Young and Fred Shuttlesworth where they could meet in Birmingham, he said, we can't take on the whole state of Alabama, we got to have help. Andy Young said, Wherever Peggy Horn is, we can meet there. So Andy Young came to this building to find a place for integrated meetings during that civil rights movement. And um, he and Peggy have always been close. And Andy Young feels very uh, good about the Episcopal Church in Birmingham. And when he preached the sermon for the consecration of the new bishop of Atlanta, did you know the new bishop of Atlanta is a black man in Atlanta? When he was preaching that sermon, he held up two model bishops for the new bishop of Atlanta, Carpenter and Tutu. I thought that was pretty amazing. And he talked a little bit about how this place had been the place where it was safe for integrated meetings to take place. And I think that was bringing Camp McDowell into, into downtown Birmingham. But that's probably enough, unless you have something special you want to ask. Thank you so much, Doug. It is always a joy and privilege to be around you. You've been such an influence not only to my family, but also to many of my friends. And I enjoy all of your stories, Doug. You are such a wonderful storyteller. And I know that most of them are true. Doug, you are such a great person. Thank you very much.